Okay, so for this lecture, we want to talk a little bit about um, shear strain. Uh, previously, we've talked about uh, nominal or engineering strain. I want to remind you of that uh, before we kind of launch into a, a transition. So recall that in our previous lecture for small strains, we had shown that um, that this quantity, the nominal engineering strain, which you might remember is delta L over L, um, could be given as the small strain tensor epsilon ij times the unit vector ni and then again unit vector nj. And we showed uh, previously that uh, E11 or epsilon 11 rather, epsilon 22 and epsilon 33 are the nominal strains in the 1, 2, and 3 directions respectively. Um, and remember that these are quantities that are measuring change in length. So in this case, this is actually delta L over L. So now let's consider changes in shape. So let's go ahead now and consider changes in shape. Right, we talked previously that deformation could be measured in two ways, change in length or change in shape. So now we're gonna, we've already considered change in length, now we're gonna consider change in shape. And we have a similar diagram to what we had drawn for change in length, but it has a little bit of a tweak to it. So I'm not going to draw the axes just to say that there's some point in space, and we define that with the material coordinate x, and under some displacement event, it that point moves to a point c. And we're going to track the, the um, motion of two differential vectors. So let's call this, whoops, let's call this one dx1 and this one we'll call that dx2 and those get mapped respectively to dc1 and dc2. Okay? And I guess we should just for completeness say that it's dx1 that's getting mapped to dc1 and dx2 that's getting mapped to dc2. Okay? All right. So one of the things that we need to be aware of is we want to talk about change in shape. And so what we really want to know is how does the angle between these two differential vectors change. So if we define whoops, define this quantity here, we'll call that theta x because that's the the angle in the the reference coordinate system and it deforms to some call it theta xi, so the angle in the deformed or the current configuration. Okay? So what we want to figure out is what's what's a good measure uh for that quantity. So here we go. So let's say to quantify the shape change, what we, we want to know, we need to know how theta x goes to theta c. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to recall way back from probably high school the, the definition of a dot product. So let's recall the following, that the dot product here of dx1 dotted with dx2, we could write as the magnitude of dx1 times the magnitude of dx2 times the cosine of the angle between them, which in this case is theta x. And similarly, we could write that the dot product of dc1 uh, with dc2 is just the magnitude of dc1 times the magnitude of dc2 times the cosine of theta c. One measure of uh, the, how the angles, how the angle changes, uh, could be just subtracting those. So we can just say one measure of the shape change. Then, 
or I'm going to put angle. Uh, would be, we could just write then dx1 dotted with dx2. dc1 dotted with dc2 minus dx1 dotted with dx2. Okay, that would be um, a measure of the angle change. Now, how are we going to how are we going to use what we know about the strain tensors to compute that? So to compute this, we want to just consider this first term. So let's go ahead and consider dc1 dotted with dc2 and if we do that uh, and we we uh, we can write that how let's use our index notation well that's going to be dci1 dci2 um, if you remember now we can use the deformation gradient tensor to relate dxi uh, to dxi. And so we do that, we can say that this must be fij dxj1, and the other term must be d, or sorry, f, uh, we'll use k in this case, ik times dxk2. Okay, we can rearrange this because uh, now we're in index form. There's no the if it was in matrix form, we'd have to worry about the order. But we can rearrange it as we as is convenient for us when we're writing it in index form. And we'll go ahead and call this equation one. Okay, so now we have this uh, this quantity basically in terms of the the deformation gradient tensor transpose times itself. Um, and we're going to now remember that we have defined strain uh, with something like that, with a term like that. So I'll just say recall that the Lagrange finite strain tensor E is given by, if you remember, uh, E J K is equal to one half times f i k or sorry f i j f i k minus delta j k. Okay, we can rearrange this and solve for this this quantity right here, which is what we need to substitute back into one, and we can write that f i j f i k is going to be equal to two e j k plus delta j k okay so now we go ahead and substitute that into equation one and when we do that we end up with d x c one dotted with d x c two is going to be equal to this quantity 2e jk plus delta jk uh, times dx j1 dx k2. And we can continue on now working through this. So this looks like 2e jk. I'm just distributing now the dx1 and the dx2 terms. So dx j. 1 dx k 2 plus delta j k times this quantity. So if you remember multiplying t this uh, Kronecker delta times this quantity just lets me swap indices. I'm going to go ahead and turn the k into a j and so I can write then this is dx j 1 dx 
j2 and hopefully you recognize this term as dx1 dotted with dx2 and so then I can uh, subtract that off of both sides and I can write the quantity that I was interested in in the beginning which is dx1 dotted with dx2 minus dx1 dotted with dx2 and that's going to be equal to 2 times ejk dx j1 dx k2 okay we'll go ahead and call this equation 2 okay now what we want to do is we want to specialize this to small strain because that's what we're going to focus on in this class so let's go ahead and specialize uh, equation 2 to small strain and we're going to choose our original dx1 and dx2 vectors to be orthogonal so we're going to and choose dx1 to be orthogonal to dx2 okay what does that mean that means that the quantity dx1 dot dx2 is equal to zero right okay so now uh, we can go ahead uh, and write what, what oh, the solution or the next por portion of the solution so we can write down that d c1 dot d c2 is going to be uh, equal to 2 E in the small strain case, the, this is the Lagrange finite strain tensor, in the small strain case just becomes the small strain tensor, so epsilon ij. Oops, let me, I had jk as my index, so I gotta be consistent. So epsilon jk dx j1 dx k2. Okay? All right, now I'm going to go ahead and oops, make that a vector. I'm going to write this as I had written it before, where this is the magnitude of dxc1 times the magnitude of dxc2 times the cosine of theta xc equals 2 epsilon jk dxj1 dxk2. Okay, so we're getting pretty close now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by the magnitude of dxc1 and the magnitude of dxc2 uh, gives the following. So it gives now cosine of theta xc is equal to 2 epsilon jk times dxj1 over the magnitude of dxc1 dxk1 over the magnitude of dxc2 I'm sorry this is 2 okay all right so now we're gonna make uh, another assumption and this assumption is valid because of the small strain case this quantity so dxj1 divided by the magnitude of dxc1, so that's the magnitude of the, or the initial vector divided by the magnitude of its deformed length. In the case of small strain, basically just gives us a unit vector, we'll call it n1, or I guess I should, since I'm using index notation, it's, it is n1, but we'll call it n1j, and then this, gives us n 2 k and remember too we'd already specialized back up here right right in this region that um, n 1 and n 2 are orthogonal directions okay so we can then write the sort of our our final formula 
as cosine of theta xi is equal to 2 epsilon ij nj1 times nk2. And we can call that equation 3. To understand what this equation is telling us, we actually probably are best off drawing a picture. So let's 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 draw a picture. Uh, we'll choose two orthogonal directions. In this case, this is going to be we'll call it n one, and in this case, it'll be n two. Okay, and that remember is from dx one and dx two, and this is, because we chose them to be orthogonal, this is originally a 90 degree angle. Under deformation, uh, that angle may change. So that um, that could be from the quantity dc2. And we've chosen to just align uh, the unit direction one in the original with uh, dc1. So there may be some rigid body modes that we're taking out, but we're basically just going to put the one the one directions from both the reference and the deform case on the same line, and then look at how the 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 two vector, as as I'll call it, has changed. So what does the quantity this represent? Well, remember that's theta c. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and define this other angle as gamma, and we'll just say, obviously you can see from trig, that remember the, the cosine of this angle, right, that's this length divided by this length, will be the same as the sine of this angle, which is this length divided by this length, those lengths are the same. So we can say that the cosine of theta xi is equal to the sine of gamma. Okay, so we can rewrite three. Right, as instead of cosine of uh, theta xi, we write that the sine of gamma is gonna be equal to two epsilon ij uh, sorry, I should, I keep, I keep forgetting I'm using J, uh, JK, so let's continue to use JK. Okay, and I need to do the same thing up here, actually, I got, I screwed that up. So that should read uh, epsilon jk okay okay one more thing that we can write from small strain so so from small strain we can write that the sine and you can just do this as a taylor series if you wanted but small strain basically means that we're going to expand about gamma equals zero and so the sine of gamma is approximately equal to gamma so then we can write that gamma, which is just the angle, is equal to 2 times epsilon jk times nj1 nk2. Okay? We can call that equation 4. Okay, this is kind of the important equation in all of this. To finish this out, and so we can really uh, answer the question that we started out to answer, which is, what do the strain terms in the small strain tensor actually mean? Um, so we, we want to just maybe do an example. So to finish, we'll go ahead and choose uh, N1. Let's say that that is 1, 0, 0. So that's just in the one direction. And we'll say that N2 is going to be in the 2 direction. So we can use equation 4 now and write that gamma is equal to, 
if we write this out in the matrix uh, form, this is just one zero zero transpose times the matrix epsilon three three. Okay, it's symmetric times the quantity zero one zero. So if we do that out, we end up with this quantity being one zero zero transpose times epsilon one two epsilon two two epsilon two three which looks like then finally just epsilon one two. Oh, I forgot. Uh, there's a two in front of all these, so we have to keep that there. Okay. Okay. So when we choose the one direction and the two direction, then what does this mean? That means that uh, two times the quantity epsilon one two, so this term, gives us the angle change between those two vectors during deformation. Okay, so similarly, we can write for 1, uh, one 3, and 2, 3. So for n1 equals 1, 0, 0, and n2 equals 0, 0, 1, right? Uh, if we have that, then... We can write that gamma is equal to uh, 2 epsilon 1, 3. And if we have n1 is equal to now 0, 1, 0. And n2 is equal to 0, 0, 1. Then we have that gamma is equal to 2 epsilon 2, 3. Okay? So what does this all mean? It means that the off-diagonal terms in the small strain tensor epsilon correspond to shear strains which I hope uh, you now associate with angles or angle changes, right? That's what a shear strain is. Uh, these all occurred, of course, during deformation. So the summary of all this is that the diagonal terms give you nominal strain, so uh, delta L over L, your, your comfortable strain that you're used to. And the off-diagonal terms give you a shear strain, and those shear strains are actually angles uh, that, were, that, were, uh, that, that are changing during deformation. So hopefully that explains uh, uh, the strain tensor, at least with enough uh, that you could uh, draw a picture of uh, what a shear strain looks like compared to what a, what a tensile strain or a length change only looks like.